And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from Isolation Games, creator of When the Moon Hangs Low, which is leading into gothic action, and is currently kickstarting a print a print run of the same game. The one the one and only Rob Lay. How are you doing today, man? Or tonight yeah, in your thank case. You. Yes, yeah. Accounting for time differences. Yeah, not too bad, thanks. I really hate time zones. <laughs> so, I'd like to start with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Um, oh. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Ooh, so, well, my first role-playing game experience, I suppose I uh, encountered role-playing games by way of Warhammer, which is... Uh, the gateway drug for a lot of UK-based role players, I think. Um, when I was, I think, probably about 11 or 12, went into a hobby store for something else and found some cool little lead rat men, which I picked up and bought and then tried to find out more about, and it led me into Warhammer. And um, that led me into uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay was my first proper roleplay game, I think, um, back in the, the sort of the first edition of Woofrup. Um, and uh, which is a bit of a different intro than some people have had. Uh, Wolfrop's, you know, a, a brilliant game, a first edition, was very um crunchy and and quite high lethality. Um, and then yeah, didn't really get into like anything like mainstream, I suppose, like um Dungeons and Dragons until I was probably sort of 16 or so. Um, when I started college, which UK college is 16 through 18, so I guess late high school for you guys. Um, and uh, yeah, and then so from there went into World of Darkness. This was like in the late '90s, so World of Darkness was all the rage. Um, things like Rifts, Slay Industries, um, but uh, yeah, so went through um, I think quite a decent spread of role play games, and um, all of it has, has sort of left its mark and driven me to where I am today with how I run games and how I write games. Mm -hmm. And. It's funny. It's funny that the t that um the two names that I keep hearing when it comes to the gate when it comes to gateway drugs for um for role playing in the UK, it's either Warhammer Fantasy or sometimes sometimes of all things, I had there was a period of months where I kept where the gateway drug that I kept hearing was Middle Earth role playing. Oh yeah, Merp. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, I did play a, a player merp, merp campaign quite a few years ago, which was yeah, very good. But again, I think it's all descended from Rollmaster, isn't it? So yeah, yes. <laughs> Mer uh, Middle Earth role playing is is considered to be a considered to have a simplified version of Rollmaster's rulebook. Yeah. Um, you can't see it, but I'm doing I'm doing giant air quotes saying that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Rollmaster. I played Rollmaster for all its faults, and I I do love it because of its Rollmaster. And yeah, Merp I think was my first introduction to Rollmaster. And I remember the first session um, we had all generated. It was a um, an alternate band of the Fellowship of the Ring, and uh, we had an Elven Knight who um, had incred incredibly high whatever it was agility or whatever the stat was. And after the sort of the, the initial cutscene, like needed to jump onto their horse and ride to the rescue of someone, rolled the first dice roll of the game, rolled a one hundred, rolled up the table, rolled again, consulted some other table, and broke both their legs by falling off their horse as the the first roll of the game. So that was my introduction to Rollmaster and Merp. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, with the, but it it does sound like that wasn't the that wasn't the beginning and end of it because. There are some folks who are one system lifers and there are some folks who jump around. Um as an aside, I do find it amusing that when I got when I got started expanding my horizons internationally, I kept hearing about how 
oh, the about how the UK answer to AD and D was um Dragon Warriors. But no but nobody I've spoken with in the UK seems to seems to have been familiar with it. Never heard of that one, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a weird it's a weird setup. I'm gonna have oh. to try and look that one up now and see what it is. It's it's a it's an interesting beast, but I'd har I'd hardly call I'd hardly call it the UK's answer to AD and D. I really fe I really feel that particular analogy that some people had made doesn't do it any favors. Oh. Yeah, I mean we played we played AD and D, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, and skills and powers. Hmm. If you remember that version, I. I think I still I think I still have my book of that in the back. Nice. Uh, so, with that in, with that in mind, um, I think you I think you may have mentioned it on the on either the Kickstarter or elsewhere, but when the moon hangs low is definitely drawing upon some of the DNA of Bloodborne. Um. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> was. Was Bloodborne an, an accelerant for the for the idea, or was it one of the um, primary catalysts? Um, I think it was probably the primary catalyst, but it the idea of what would become when the moon hangs low sort of started before. Um, mentioning AD and D, one of my favourite AD and D settings of all time was the original Ravenloft. Um, and uh, again, things like in Warhammer, there's um, sort of the whole sort of background vibe of Warhammer and especially there was a, a game called uh, Mordheim a couple of years ago. Um, these are all sort of things like percolating around and I'd run a couple of games that weren't When the Moon Hangs Low for my friends that would, but if you looked at them now, they they would, they sort of, they were the proto When the Moon Hangs Low. But then, yeah, I played Bloodborne when it came out and was sort of immediately like, oh God, this is such a cool setting. Um, you know, and like the, I played FromSoft stuff in the past i played um dark souls mm. um but the bloodborne approach to it was just so sort of atmospheric and so um interesting that i was like oh you know the idea of being rather than being like a, an open world with like oh here's a forest here's a, a a cave system oh there's a small village it was just one terrible city um kind of got my my brain whirring and i just finished um publishing my previous role play game um tormented and mm -hmm. i was sort of in a in a situation where i was like i always like having projects to work on and i was thinking what can i do next and then I was, again in the back of my mind i was still playing through bloodborne i was like actually you know i like the idea of this sort of gothic horror um pseudo victorian um sort of cursed city setting and again it kind of meshed with the things i love from ravenloft um, some of the World of Darkness stuff, um, the Warhammer kind of vibe, and yeah, it all sort of came together to to create when the moon hangs low. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, for a lot for a lot of folks, they end up they end up using an established system that that just gets house ruled into oblivion until they create their own. Was did you have a similar? Kind of, kind of story with that, with with some, with either when the moon hangs lower, or, or even previous projects where it started out as just house ruling and then just got out of hand from there. Yeah, I mean, uh, so my first um, published game is um, a game called Age of Steel, which is a, a diesel punk setting, hmm. um, and the system for that started um, what well years ago now. It was eight years before I published it, and that was a couple of years ago, so it's probably a good sort of ten years ago, um, I started running games for my friends, and rather than using any of the other sort of the, the systems around, I, I had um, adapted uh, Interlock or Fusion, which is the Cyberpunk 2020 game, um, which is stat plus skill plus D20, uh, D10. Mm -hmm. um, and then we started using D6s, and it sort of mutated into a system that whenever we were like, oh, let's come up with a new setting, we kind of defaulted to this system because it's quite sort of modular and simple. And then when I um, started actually creating Age of Steel as its own 
thing with the intent of building a um a book that would then go on to be published i um took that system and sort of stripped it back to its core elements and then started designing a, a dice system around that. And then I've used that dice system in all of my published games so far. So first of all, in Age of Steel, then in Tormented, and then in, now in When the Moon Hangs Low. Mm -hmm. And it is, a, it is a pretty simple setup with using um, D6s on a hit-based approach. Uh, but from what... from Unlike some games that use sk that use skills, as I understand it, um, whether you're untrained, trained, or mastered, that's going to determine the the um, what what counts it, what's going to count as a hit and what isn't going to count as a hit when it comes to d the d sixes. Yes. Yeah. So you you roll. You have um three stats: uh, physical, mental, and social. Um, and those those gauge how many dice you roll, and then depending on whether you're yeah you're trained untrained or mastered in a skill you're looking for fives or sixes four fives or sixes or three four fives or sixes on the dice and then counting the number of successes yeah and this is this is where the this is where um trying to adapt any of the souls likes into tabletop get, can get interesting because a lot of a lot of stuff that's kind of become standard with role playing games isn't really something that you see in um souls like things li things like some sort of ability upgrade tri um setup or the like everything kind of doubles down on core attributes and equipment yeah i mean uh, for me very much with the uh, with the when the moon hangs low i was more um it's the the sort of the theme and the style that I'm trying to emulate. Although, again, the the sort of the the mechanics of the the game, I was also trying to slightly sort of fit in there as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, and of and of course, when it of course when it comes to the skill setup, there's also the whole issue of um, knacks, which <clears throat> if I'm would it be sit would it be fair of me to say that Nax in this system is akin to a specialization? Yes, it is, yeah. Yeah, so you, you pick three skills at character gen to have a knack for. Mm -hmm. Um and um you gain bonus dice to roll on that, which which could be used to represent a specialization. So I've had um players create incredibly specialized characters where they've got, you know, their main stat and then they've got the skill in that stat. At, at mastered and then they've taken a, a knack for that skill so they're just rolling you know seven eight dice and having to get threes or more but then i've also had people use it to represent um a skill that ne maybe the character isn't naturally good at or naturally skilled at but is naturally good at so they've got you know two extra dice they're still only looking for like fives or sixes because they're untrained but they're rolling a lot more dice mm -hmm. now when it comes to when it comes to edges, mm. uh, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure some could make the comparison that edges are akin to feats, but one thing that I noticed that isn't really present when it comes to the feat system is that it isn't it is far less granular, especially given the limited amount of edges that you're going to um, you're going to have. Yeah, so the edges are the so the um, magic powers, maybe not magic. There's you know kind of there are some that are just sort of physical abilities. Mm -hmm. But when I was creating edges, there um, I wanted none of the none of the edges should just make you better at doing one thing. So it, originally, when I was first designing it, I did have edges that were like roll an extra two d six when you use intimidate or you know things like that. Mm -hmm. But I I thought they felt a bit sort of plain and it just was more dice. So the sort of the rule I had for when I was writing edges and when I create new ones in the future, it's they should give a character something that no other character can do unless they've got that edge as well. So it's not just, you know, um, oh, I, I roll two extra dice. Well, I've got a very high stat, so I'm just as good as you with your your edge. So they're all like things like, oh, I can step into a shadow and step out of a different shadow somewhere else. I can teleport through dark space, you know, or... I can um, roll extra dice on damage, which is sort of what I was just saying about not rolling extra dice. But it's you know it's a a, a one-off ability that makes 
a particular hit in combat more devastating. Mm-hmm. Now, one question that I f- that I often find myself asking, especially when you have a game that ha- that has a fair that has a fair amount of high damage, is how is how do you make it so that you so that you don't have the you don't have the issue of guns um outdo outdoing everything else uh i mean well yeah that's the 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 eternal question especially in like systems like this where um you want melee to be just as punchy as ranged weapons but not without you know kind of making guns feel underpowered so um I mean, my, the way I look at it is that guns provide a ranged option, um, and also they've got um, a couple of extra um, abilities, so that um, guns can be um, uh, fired into crowds and get um, bonuses at hitting at, at close range. So, you know, the long if if you're using a gun at its sort of optimal range, you're more likely to hit your opponent. Um, in the the combat system as well, um, guns can only be dodged, whereas melee attacks can be dodged or parried or counterattacked. Mm. So it means that uh, your um, a target you're you're aiming your gun at has only you know, one option of getting out the way, whereas in close combat they've got three, um, and one of those options in melee combat allows you to sort of um, stagger the opponent so that they become easier to hit in in, in future rounds. Mm-hmm. Is that that's the other thing? When you when I look at Bloodborne compared to other other um other works that Miyazaki has done, you start to see the opening signs of a lot, of a lot of the Perry stuff that would become far more prevalent in stu- in stuff like Sekiro. But how do you? But one of the key, one of the key things was was I distinctly recall Miyazaki wanting to not have people play as defensively. As in, as in, say, Dark Souls. Um, how do you, in your case, how do you carry over that that sense of a more aggressive style within the confines of when the moon hangs low? Yeah, so it was that was again something I was sort of considering when I was trying to create when uh, when the moon hangs low. I was like, you know, what's Bloodborne. Bloodborne's got this very sort of visceral combat where it is like attack, attack, attack. You know, and it's um, so the uh, the counterattack rule is is sort of the main sort of uh, way I've tried to introduce that. So when you're attacked in melee combat, you can parry the blow, which if you're successful you take no damage. You can dodge the blow, which if you're successful you take no damage, or you can counterattack, which you um, it's a, a matched. Um, roll against your attacker and if the defender is successful they still take damage uh but the attacker is then staggered which is like a status that means that they're easier to hit but with melee attacks in the future um and to undo that actually requires an action to sort of rewrite yourself to regain your footing so it's the uh, it and in play tests uh, I sort of messed around with a couple of different variations of how counterattacks works, and this is the one that seemed to encourage players to be like, you know, no, charge forwards. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna charge forwards and take on the ghoul in close combat. I'm gonna stagger it and keep attacking it. I, I will take damage, but I'm gonna keep it on its back foot so that the rest of the 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 party can then like, you know, nip in and out and attack. And again, the um the sort of the NPCs when I'm designing them, most of the minions um have a, a rule that says they will only ever dodge. But higher sort of boss characters will also or can also use the stagger attack on on um, players, so it sort of opens it up as well and makes it a lot more yeah sort of um, pressing to get into close combat and try and stagger your opponent before they do the same to you. Mm-hmm. And just out of curiosity, has anyone has anyone approached you about the concept of um, trick weapons? Yes, yeah. So um, we did uh, again early on. The sort of the bloodborne influences were a lot more apparent in when the moon hangs low, and, and through um, the course of play testing it, we slowly trimmed them out um, because it felt a little bit too on the nose. And this, it, when the moon hangs low, is it's taking themes from bloodborne, but it's not trying to be bloodborne. So while it's it's very obvious that that's where the influences came from, I'm trying to make it its own setting and story, um, but. 
trick weapons are one of the things I do like about um, Bloodborne. So there are weapon customizations. So you can add serrated blades to um, allow you to re-roll one damage dice per combat. So, you know, oh, I rolled a three, I'd rather, you know, roll it again, I get a six. Um, or you can add um, keen blades, which allow you to re-roll one of your dice to hit. Um, you can add um, attachments to ranged weapons as well to make them more accurate or um, to, to better pierce through armor, things like that. Mm. Um, and one of the original customizations was a sort of a transforming weapon to allow you to you know, have a, a, a sword that becomes a, a gun and things like that. But it became uh, quite fiddly to write sort of succinct rules that didn't take up paragraphs and... and um, you know, I, I, in the original play test, some of the players were like, "I've used it. It just gets so un, you know, unwieldy and strange." In the end, we just sort of did away with that. Mm -hmm. And even with that, one thing that I did notice when it came to the equipment listing is that compared to the rate of the rate of HP, um. Weapons are very high damage. Even the lowest, t even the lowest tier, can be particularly nasty. Yeah, and it's. I mean, it's. It's again. I think probably coming from a background of things like Warhammer um, and like Cyberpunk. I, I'm a great believer that um, I don't like um, sort of bullet sponge characters. Um, it's one of the my big issues I have with Dungeons and Dragons is that high level characters can just take ridiculous amounts of damage. Um, which, you know, I like d and I love playing a, a big bullet sponge in D&D &D occasionally. But with my games, I want it to be so that, you know, I, even a, a veteran character can be brought low by, a, you know, a, just a lowly zombie. You know, with a particularly good hit, you're, you you should always feel like there is some threat. And again, with When the Moon Hangs Low, it was intended to be quite a sort of a gritty, um, not... Um, overly crunchy but sort of you know there is the, the the option that your high level character if you mess up and get you know swarmed by level like level low level characters or low level monsters you're still you know you could be in in some real trouble mm -hmm. now of course of course one of the big things in in something like bloodborne that clearly appealed to you was everything taking place within the, within this particular city um with that with that in mind do you ha within the full book do you have do you have something to support um random events when it comes to cities just to just to keep things from getting too predictable Oh uh, yeah so the in the original PDF we had some random tables at the back for generating you know strange events that happen as your character walks through the city <clears throat> excuse me um, and as part of the Kickstarter, um, I've been releasing some free supplements, um, and one of them was a a supplement for um, GMless or solo uh, role playing in When the Moon Hangs Low. Um, and as part of that, I added yet more tables for like weird stuff that happens in each region of the city, um, and that's that's been so well received that it's now the plan that the the the, the printed book will have this added into it. Um, so um yeah there'll be even more random tables and you know if i depending on how well we do and i've got some more time to work on it i might even expand those at the moment they're d6 tables um i keep everything d6 because that's the dice in the in the system but um you can you can you know use 2d6 to make a d66 table with 36 results which i think i might try and do that for some of these random tables because i actually quite enjoy write, writing them it's quite fun coming up with these sort of random little events yeah and as someone who's a fan of the insanity that can happen with um, life path systems in, cer in certain games, <laughs> especially cyberpunk, mm. um, I'm certainly not opposed to that. Now, with that in with that in mind, given the given the given the way health given the way health works and the and and the way and um the way experience works. Have is this a is this a game that has a certain that has a certain ideal length in terms of campaigns, or do you think that when the moon hangs low can support long term as well as short term campaigns? Yeah, it definitely can support long term. I've um, so again, I 
I always run my own games to mm -hmm. test them, and then I send them out to play testers as well. And as part of running when the moon hangs low for my sort of my test group, we did we've done little one-offs, but then we have done a, a decent length campaign which lasted a couple of months um, and took you know the span of you know repeated. I'm trying to think, maybe sort of a couple of dozen um, ep individual episodes, and yeah, it took the the players from. Uh, newly arrived hunters in Haramir, the city it's set in, uh, all the way up to sort of fairly decent veterans who are actually tackling one of the the sort of the many mysteries of the cursed city. Um, so yeah, it definitely supports that. And the so the there's a, a sort of a downtime loop system that's built into it, which is intended to sort of keep your characters maintained. And it's sort of as part of that you have to like choose you know whether you're making sure your character has healed this time or has has spent some time regaining their resolve so it's a, it, it's intended to sort of yeah for sort of medium to to long term play to actually be quite sort of tactical and you know do you look after your character's physical health or do you look after their spiritual health that kind of thing mm -hmm. um do you consider when the moon hangs low to be a game that favors um theater of the mind grid based or or one that could accommodate both I mean, it probably could accommodate both. I personally always run Theatre of the Mind. Um, it's only been since the pandemic and moving on to um, platforms like Roll20 and um, Forge that I've actually started using like battle maps regularly. We used to, like you know, back in the day, sketch them out on graph paper and just use pencils to say, oh, I'm over here and the dragon's over here. Um, but most of our role playing was always theater of the mind, so that's always how I've kind of written my games. But it does uh, when the moon hangs low uses a sort of a standard unit, so yeah, you could quite easily convert this to battle map use. Mm -hmm. And since you mentioned that, do you do you have plans down the road to put to put in some add add on specifically for virtual tabletop support? I mean, I would, yeah, I'd love to. Um, I've had people approach me and say oh can i build character sheets for roll 20 um which i said yeah no you know go ahead um i've not actually seen any product of that yet but yeah if um if the kickstarter was wildly successful i would quite happily pay a um a vtt developer to, to move into that um but in the meantime yeah it's definitely something that i would like to see because i you know i'd love that level of support yeah and It'd probably be easiest to do it with Mythic Table since Mythic Table is open source. But now the now um obviously for something that's that's leaning into dark gas lamp fantasy, we have to have a bit of well, darkness. So I'd like to go into the concept of boon and curse in insofar as character creation and how it how those things affect um in gameplay. Sure. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> every character um, is um, is a hunter, and every hunter has a mark. And the mark is the, um, the idea that all the characters have kind of been drawn to Haramir um, because they've had this strange brush with the forces of darkness. Um, and uh, character Jen sort of um, says, you know, how did you have this brush of darkness? Why, you know, what what's has it taken from your past life? But uh, the main thing that a um, your brush of darkness has left you with is this mark uh, which in the main book there's six for six different marks um there's another four that you can get by joining our discord and then um if the kickstarter um there were two backer slots to create some more marks so hopefully we might have a, a grand total of about 12 marks to choose from in the final book um, and each mark is um, a sort of a, a spiritual scar on your character's soul that's made them different somehow. Uh, and each mark gives you a boon, which is, you know, this strange ability that actually helps you and also a curse, mm -hmm. which is, you know, the thing that will eventually destroy your character. And all marks are permanent and inescapable. So it's not just a case of if your character will succumb to their curse, it's, it's when. Um and yeah so the boon um there's things like uh you can sense the presence of evil uh by concentrating on the scar that's left on you so you can it, by the the sort of throbbing pain will will tell you if there's something evil nearby and by concentrating on how painful it is you can tell where that evil is mm -hmm. um and or there's ones that allow you to see ghosts um which 
is its own, you know, issue. You're constantly surrounded by these sort of translucent, sad specters that unnerve you, but can point you in directions. You know, you know, um, one of them miming to sort of tell you that there's a hidden door, or maybe sort of trying to warn you that there's an attack about to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the curses are things like they're um, in stages and they slowly get worse. And the more that you witness horrible things or use your powers. Um, and push yourself, your curse gets worse. Um, so for the um, the tainted hunter, um, they they slowly are becoming more animalistic as there's an, an animal spirit within them. So they they start off um, maybe occasionally sort of forgetting how to be human and sort of you know sniffing like an animal or occasionally like growling rather than talking, and then they will. Um, slowly begin to like physically transform they might grow patches of fur or pointed ears um then um all of the curses have a a stage at which the curse is getting quite bad but it gives you an option to actually regain resolve which is the sort of the spiritual meta currency by doing something even worse um and so the tainted hunters um stage at that stage can um give in to their animal nature at which point they just black out for a couple of hours and they wake up you know a bit later with more resolve mm-hmm. but they feel oddly full and they've gone out and they they, they might have blood stains or they might find you know bits of skin they've they've gone out and eaten something they don't know what you know they've let the animal run wild um and then the final stage is where like the curse is almost upon you and you know the for the tainted hunter is where they begin a physical transformation becoming something almost like a werewolf um and they have to take pains to like cover themselves to avoid freaking people out and and causing lo- resolve loss in other people. Uh, and then the final stage of uh, if you push your curse too often and and not looked after yourself, you become lost. Um, at which point the character is not playable anymore. Um, but it's never just the play. The character is dead. It's the character. This something something happens to the character that they sort of vanish into the city and they could be used as a, a an antagonist for a future game. Or, you know, I've even had um, some players try and hunt down their friends to, like, save them in some way, which never really goes as, as well as they were hoping. But, you know, it's, a, it's a, nice, a nice little sort of story beat. The first thing that came to mind when you said that is Father Gascogne. Mm. Yes, yeah. Um, or we say Gascoigne in the, yes. in the UK. But, <laughs> but yes, um, yeah, it's that sort of idea of, you know, there's this, they've, they've, completely succumbed to their curse and even trying to save them sometimes the best way to save them is just to actually make sure they're not hurting anyone else mm-hmm. now what you mentioned resolve would it be fair of me to assume that resolve is the extra effort type of mechanic within the game yeah it's the um it, it one of the um goals i sort of set myself with when the moon hangs low is um not using the words sanity or madness or using, you know, like, um, in, or insanity and not using sanity as a meta currency because it, there are, you know, we're growing more aware of mental health, especially since the pandemic. And using sort of sanity as a currency that can be spent is upsetting to some people. And so I was thinking, well, it'd be nice to find a, a sort of a meta currency that represents wearing yourself out without, you know, wearing out your, your sanity. And so resolve is that sort of, it's a measure of physical, mental, spiritual um, resolve. Um, that as you use your powers, so as you use an edge, you spend resolve. Um, if you get tired, you spend resolve. If you are lost in the dark, you lose resolve. If you see something horrible, you lose resolve. And um, yeah, the more you run out of resolve, the more that your curse increases. Mm-hmm. And with now with that in mind i've mentioned this in the past but there's always there's always a risk of the rainy day paradox happening especially when you ha- have have dot, have um some sort of limited mechanic or some sort of limited resource you can ha- you can have people fall into what we like to call the rainy day paradox or to put it another way the 99 mega elixirs yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. So what I'm curious about is, have you had a situation like that where somebody is really defensive with using Resolve? 
I mean, yes, it, there were some some like like some of my players have played like that in the past, like refusing to use their powers until the last minute. But I think by and large, most people um, buy in to the idea, and it's, I'm always a big fan of maybe not as exactly like the full session zero, but like the idea that before you start a game, you say to your players, right, this is the kind of game we're playing. You know, it's not your your job to win. You're just trying to tell this cool story. And it's like, well, I play a lot of Call of Cthulhu um, as well. And we're always, you know, everyone kind of embraces the idea of it'd be cool to keep your character alive or and, and sane. But ultimately the most fun is had when you do lean into it and you do open the, the, the door to stare out into the dark and see the, the deep ones out there. You know, you know, we all know it's more sensible to to lock the door and run in the opposite direction direction, but that's not the, the kind of game we're playing. And again, with when the moon hangs low, it's when you kind of explain to the players and go, look, spending a resolve and embracing your curse, that's kind of the job. And it's, that's uh, again, when I designed the levels of the curse, they're meant to be quite fun to fall into so um, I've had most of the players I do play, they're like, yeah, spending resolve because they actually want to unlock, you know, the next level of their curse. So they get to, you know, start being strange and you know, eating weird stuff and howling at the moon, things like that. Oh. Well, at, at, le at least nobody's, at least nobody's ever tried to, ever try, at least nobody's ever tried to, um, <laughs> well, I had some. I had something there, but no, but no, oh, it's well. gone. <laughs> um, I'd like to explore putting. I'd like to explore putting into practice because we've talked about the marks, um, mm. and if I recall, in the you mentioned there being um, six in the in the core book. I'd like I'd like you to go through one of them it's to get kind of the um, boons and cur and curses that it that that particular mark has. Sure, sure. So, um, uh, I mean, I'm quite a fan of all of them, but I think I'll go with the uh, the ravenous one because this is the one I, I created to actually try and make a bad guy mark. Um, I mean, they're all kind of bad guy marks, but um, so the ravenous um, hunter is someone who's um, been cursed with an insatiable hunger. Um, they've kind of been, you know, blessed, cursed to always be hungry. Um, and it's the sort of the em embracing the sort of this want need to, to consume things. So their boon is regeneration, which um, allows them to um, once per scene um, just to instantly regain um, either D6 health, which is kind of the, the sort of the lighter injuries, or remove one wound from their wound track. And you only have a set number of wounds in your wound track. So that's, you know, allows you to regenerate quite a, a lot of um, health. In, in one go um, but their curse is this insatiable hunger mm -hmm. so at the lightest level when you first start playing them um, it's suggested that um, the characters you know you, every now and then when you're playing the character you mention that the character's eating something you know either they're like, chewing on like dried meat or they're like eating like snacks or you know even you know at, like in quiet moments there's always some munching going on from the ravenous characters um when their curse uh, first, the first stage, you know, you failed your first, um, you, you've run out of resolve fully for the first time. You become what's called touched. Mm. Um, you get the the curse extreme omnivore, which uh, anything organic begins to look like food. So um, even stuff that's uh, normally unpalatable, so things like rotten food, leather, bits of paper, um, stagnant water. You know, the character will once they've finished eating all the snacks they've got in their pockets, they'll just pick up you know, a piece of book off the side and start chewing on that. Um, the important thing to note, though, is that it doesn't actually mean that they can eat that. So, and it doesn't actually make them feel any more um, sated when they do it, this stuff. It's just that, you know, they can no longer stop themselves from just eating just random crap from around the area. Mm. Um, and again, I've had, like, players with, with this mark, they were, like, you know, just randomly picking up, like, one of them picked up a rat at one point and was munching on a rat and, and like, couldn't fathom why everyone else was suddenly grossed out. Um, so then the, the second stage, which is embraced, is Awful Feast. And this is one of the ones that allows the player to, or the character, re regenerate resolve by doing something bad. So um, they their hunger expands to a new and disturbing direction, which is raw meat. Mm -hmm. um, so a character at this stage can regain D6 resolve by consuming a huge meal of uncooked bloody flesh, which they must devour in a savage and disgusting manner. Um, 
it can come from any source but um yeah they have to like, undergo this ritual of basically like right fine i'm going to get a load of raw meat sit down and just stuff myself with it um and you know anyone who comes across them is like while they're doing this is going to be either horrified or they have to take you know the player has to take steps to make sure their character's undisturbed so it's this kind of trade off of doing something gross and weird but you get resolve back and you you can regenerate resolve mm-hmm. um and then the um the next stage is consumed which is the thirsting aura um and this is when the curse is almost at its full the the character begins to radiate a sort of an entropic field around them that like saps the life force so they're no, no longer just physically hungry they're like spiritually hungry so um the character sort of um small plants and animals just die in their presence and people start feeling like sick and weak um and the character um basically every hour like inflicts 1d6 damage on every living creature within five yards Mm -hmm. um the character can try and suppress this and like by using a sort of concentration they can actually like will their their thirsting aura to shut down for a little while but they have to keep doing that um so it's like the character literally comes kind of like a, a sort of a walking wasteland is a term i quite like um, where they, it's, and again, it's this kind of um, slightly leaning on the vampire thing, like the idea of you know a vampire walks into a room and all the plants turn grey and wither. It's the sort of this the idea that that's what the character is becoming. Mm. Um, and then finally, when they're lost, so their lost status is called leech. Um, the character uh, becomes an abominable fle- flesh-eating monster. Um, they sort of vanish into the city and um, begin to prey on the the sort of the people who live there. Um, so again, it is like this sort of the vampire myth of the character will become the sort of flesh eating, blood drinking monster. Um, and it's normally, you know, down to other hunters to make sure they don't do any more harm. Yeah. And what, would it be fair of me to say that once you're, once you're on the path, it's, a, it's significantly hard to get off of it? Yes. Yeah. So again, this plays into like the downtime system that I've um, built in. So um after you so the after you've played a a session and you've gone out and slain some monsters and you've come back to the safe part of haramir um there's a a a downtime system that allows your character sort of to simulate like a a period of rest and recovery and again one of the influences behind when the moon hangs low was darkest dungeon um and this was sort of very much where this came from and during a downtime period you have three actions that you can have your character undertake and one of the actions is to regain health. One of the actions is to, to remove wounds from your wound track. One of them is to regain some resolve. And one of them is to st- step backwards off a level from your curse. Um, but that does mean that, you know, you have to choose quite tactically, you know, whether you've, you you know, if your character's taken injuries, that might be two of your actions straight gone. And if you want some more resolve for the next one, that's the one's gone. Or do you want to step backwards, you know, re- re- recover some of your curse? But it means that you might not be fully healed or fully rested for the next game, things like that. Mm-hmm. Now, with that in, with that in mind, were there any any combinations of things or or the like in testing where something un, something unintentional got it got um not I won't say intentionally exploited. That sounds a bit too nefarious, but um somebody discovered a combination you hadn't accounted for that could create problems if left unchecked yeah i mean well with with uh when the moon hangs low less so um because this system has already been quite heavily play tested through the the previous two games that i've iterated it through but there are this um when the moon hangs low did introduce things like the downtime system is new um the idea of uh penalty dice is new but yeah i definitely did especially with like the the early trick weapon um design um we we worked out because I the the way I'd worded it with, with um you could add um customizations to bayonets and then you could also add bayonets onto ranged weapons and people worked out because of the way that I worded it that they all stacked so we had people building rifles with loads of customizations and then getting a bayonet with loads of customizations snapping the two together and killing big monsters in a single hit because it's like well, I can re-roll the damage from my my rifle and re-roll the damage from my bayonet. And they both give me bonus dice to hit. So it's, <laughs> we had people like lunging in with, a, with this overly complicated rifle with a bayonet on the end and, and like one-shotting a big monster. So I was like, right, fine, that doesn't count anymore. <laughs> um, 
and I, I back in the mists of when I was developing Age of Steel. Um, Age of Steel is like a 1930s sort of World War One, World War Two setting with like things like machine guns. Uh, the way I originally calculated machine gun damage, I, the first play test, I had a character pick up a machine gun and blow up a tank in a single shot. Uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's not how machine guns worked. Yeah, no, and again, the the, the rules got changed. <laughs> yeah, and nor normally I I am all I'm all in favor of um, people coming up with combinations to try and br to try and break systems, but uh, if it en if the if it ends up getting to the point where in it, where the entire um, sandbox gets broken because of one of those, that's a step too far. Yes, yeah. Like, I got I got myself in a fair bit of trouble when I used to play when I used to play a lot of Halo Two because I was the one guy who outright defended BXR. If you're familiar with that little trick, no. <laughs> oh, the short version of it is you do, you would um you would do melee and then you and then use an exploit to um animation cancel and then uh, immediately right. start shooting. Right. <laughs> um. This won't. This only worked with the. This only worked with the battle rifle for whatever reason. But the point is, the battle rifle was supposed to be the jack of all trades weapon, and because of this little trick, it turned it into a close a close range weapon instead. And because of, and because of that, things could get a little bit nuts. But that is, but that is an ex that is an example of get of getting close to the line when it comes to this kind of thing. There are uh, there are of course other 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 approaches, and well, D well D and D has Codzilla, or in more recent editions, Cowzilla, <laughs> of just completely snapping the game in two. But with with that in with that in mind i'm cu i'm curious if um if there are if there are options if somebody is go if somebody's going down the curse path to um bring themselves back bring themselves back from going off the edge yeah i mean definitely yeah there's um so there's the downtime system that do allow, does you allow you to like step back one step. So repeated use of that could take you from, um, you know, right at the edge back to a, a normal hunter. You're still under the effects of your base level of the curse, um, and you know, traveling up and down the sort of the curse tiers is is perfectly doable. And and when you step back, you you your it's you know it takes a couple of hours in game. But the the after effects of you know even if you've physically transformed into something strange, if you step back a level, it does those transformations do go away as your sort of the character regains their humanity. Um, but there are also items in the game, so there's um, sort of holy relics that will allow you to resist your curse. And um, even uh, I've run plots in the past where um, it's sort of the goal of a particular plot of of trying to re regress their curse again. Con cus uh, hunters can never escape their curse, mm -hmm. but it's the idea of sort of staving it off for another day to try and you know do a little bit more good, last one more day kind of thing. So yeah, it's it's not a a case of your character will ha is has a really limited lifespan, but the it's trying to embrace the idea that these characters are kind of like doomed heroes. Mm -hmm. Now. In a lot of cases, when you, it's hard to not look at um, a game like Bloodborne, just like any other Souls like, and not bring up um, boss design, especially in the sense that a lot of bosses th throughout the series have a kind of phase system when it comes to their patterns. Yeah, uh, is that something that you've considered in integrating with with B bag level antagonists of the, of them getting different um different abilities when the when their hp is at certain thresholds oh uh, yeah it's definitely it's something that i've actually i've got a like a scratch pad of loads of like ideas for when the moon hangs low mm -hmm. and one of them is um like boss level or i've called them titan level like monsters 
Um, and uh, there's a, a YouTuber called Z Bashu, um, who's an animator who does animations and talks about game theory with Dungeons and Dragons. He come up, came up with a very elegant um, kind of Souls-like boss sort of counter where the bosses on the first round will wind up and it's a, it works very well on um, battle mats, wind up and set a pattern for where their attack's going to land on the next round. Um, and then you've then got, you know, the characters can get out the way or try and do something. But then if they do, they're they still in the area of effect, they automatically get hit, mm-hmm. which is quite a nice le- way of doing things like that. And it's, it's something that I've been sort of looking at as well. Like, I really like the idea of having monsters in a sort of very... Um, shadow of the colossus style where you know there's a weak point and attacking the weak point does something or maybe the you know the monster has three different attacks and attacking certain weak points remove you know two of those attacks or you know the idea that yeah like you say a sort of a hit point related kind of transformation sequence that kind of thing Mm. so it's definitely something i'm still working on and uh, i you know down the road once the kickstarter's done with i would i'm definitely considering like putting out more supplements for when the moon hangs low and adding like souls like bosses would certainly be something i'd love to to explore it's just trying to find uh, an elegant system that kind of slots into the existing system of of how the game works at the moment because i don't want the one the thing i hate about some role play games is they'll introduce you know, oh, you know, for this, you know, vehicle system, and the the subsystem is completely at odds to the rest of the system, and it sort of really sort of disconnects from, you know, I'm rolling d6 of this, and it's like there was a the the fusion system, mm-hmm. where they introduced um, uh, like starship class, um, well, starships, um, and the damage system went from being rolled damage to being static blocks of damage, and it just sort of it didn't quite translate in my my opinion and so yeah sort of with the with the the idea of designing sort of like yeah like raid boss kind of monsters i'd want it to sort of feel like a natural progression of the system mm-hmm. i can i can certainly get behind that now with that in, with that in mind during all during all the playtesting for when the moon hangs low what were what would you say would be some of the biggest takeaways that you've had in terms of what Ooh. you've learned, yeah, I mean, it's um, a lot of it was about balance and things like that, which is always when you're creating a new system, it's sort of working out where the the balance of like things like weapon damage, um, character generation. They, there was a lot of play testing around like um, the amount of points you have to spend when you first create a character, um, whether um, weapons and armor are correctly balanced, and and how expensive like things like gear and customizing your weapons and you know things like that um so that was a lot of where the playtesting went because the skill system had already been sort of designed and tested in my previous games um but then it was also a lot of things about um yeah like like i said like wording on the um weapon customizations making sure that there's nothing that is too broken or not effective enough um like one of the the marks got completely redesigned the um the tainted mark was originally a lot more werewolfy um and got sort of um redesigned so it's still very animalistic but it's a bit less werewolf um it's a bit so they were originally a lot more of a sort of a all of their powers were geared straight towards fighting and people were saying well you know if i want to play one of these but i don't want to play a, a fighter character it's completely useless and now they've thought of a lot more it's about like animals and hunting and things like that and heightened senses. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's mostly where a lot of the sort of, sort of the influence, uh, the the, the playtesting sort of um, benefits came. Um, but I mean, again, with all the the, the playtesting, a lot of it is just seeing how people interact with your system and how they interpret it. And it's um, that's one of the things I love about it is like writing stuff uh, writing background writing settings and then seeing how different player groups interpret those settings and what they take away from them and the sort of the theories they come up with because uh, when the moon hangs low has a lot of unanswered questions in its setting intentionally um and i i got so many different sort of like oh i think the plague 
came from here and um, this is quite obviously you know what this thing is and oh we 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 did this game and we suspect this this and this and it's it's really fascinating to see how different people you know reach two different conclusions mm -hmm. well there's no there's there's no one way to rome but all roads do lead to rome exactly yeah now with that with that in with that in mind um even be even beyond the ki obviously there's the Kickstarter for the print run, but beyond that, what other plans do you have for when the moon hangs low in the coming months or years, for that matter? Um, well, yeah. So I've um, my my current sort of scratch pad. I do have, uh, like I say, there's this um, boss enemy supplement, which is actually something I do. I really do. I am quite keen on putting out there because it's you know a big thing for like from soft games and bloodborne the idea of having these big monstrous enemies mm -hmm. um there's also um uh, an investigation subsystem which is something i realized a while ago is that a lot of role play games that um focus on investigation they're all of the onus on creating the mystery and laying out the clues and how those clues are found by the players is, is placed on the games master. And it's like things like Call of Cthulhu. Um, oh God, I'm trying to think of the other ones. There were some examples. They all, trail, they, you know, they, trail of Cthulhu. Yeah. Well, trail of Cthulhu. Yeah. It's in fact, trail of Cthulhu is better, but it still is very down to the games master to say, you know, these are the clues. There's more, um, opportunity given to players to to find clues using any skill but it's still yeah the games master has to to work out what those clues are and how they reveal the mystery um something i've started reading recently is um oh brindlewood bay um which has a, a very elegant little system that allows players to uncover clues kind of separate to the games master and as they uncover more clues it gives them more moves that allow them to like uncover the conspiracy themselves which i think is is really elegant and sort of takes away a, a lot of the emphasis that the, the games master has to come up with these ideas themselves so th that's the one thing that i'm currently trying to again turn over is like how to gamify solving an, a, a, a mystery um and creating that as a separate supplement mm -hmm. um and then um, the other thing I would always like to put out is I'm, I'm a, a big fan of published campaigns, um, whether people run them or not, or just use them for, in, uh, for sort of um, inspiration. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, I always like putting out published campaigns. So there is one that I, I've got um, in my head, which has is, is been something that I've kind of run as a test run for some of my players, but I would like to turn it into like a, a printed published game. Mm-hmm. I'm, gu I'm guessing. I'm guessing when it comes to when it comes to that, you'd ha would that be would that be akin to a module, or would you want to go with a full on, um, mo a full on story? Uh, it's probably yeah, sort of like a like an old school D and D module. Um, it's sort of more less like a dungeon crawl, but basically, it's uh, there's a in the the setting of when the moon hangs low. There's an abandoned sanitarium, mm -hmm. um, which has got lots of sort of ghost stories about it, and it would be exploring that but with some like random terrain generation and some suggestions for like reasons the players would get drawn here so very sort of like um kind of like the old old school like space hulk explorations where you know you know you it and it's oh you here's a corridor with six rooms and then you can randomly generate the rooms like quickly on the fly and 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 make sh and and uh, make people deathly afraid of the number three <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because because of that whole that whole um, radar thing, which um, it's funny you meant it's funny you mentioned that because I was playing um, Deathwing a, a couple weeks ago with some of, with some of my buddies. Um, which that game is absolutely terrible playing it solo, and an absolute blast playing it with um other victims. I mean people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if only so that I can watch them get freaked out whenever a brood lord shows up. Yeah. <laughs> the sudden panic, yeah. Uh, although some of them were mad at me because I didn't tell them those kind of things would show up. But 
I li I liken it to how everybody who's a dungeon master has a bit of dickishness in them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we don't set out to up upset our players, but sometimes when it happens, it is it's quite gratifying. Well, the thing is, the thing is, mo mo most of my players will always th will always think I'm set. I'm going out of my way to upset them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which I'm usually I'm usually not, but I'll let them think I'll let them think that. It makes my jo it makes my job more fun. Exactly, and uh, yeah, the games master's got to have as much fun as the players at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Even if it's at other people's expense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way up to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. And thank you for having me up in the, uh, the temple. It's been oh, lovely to talk to you and to talk about my game. Mm-hmm. And any time you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. I will drink to that. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>